Hello, this is Joanne and this is the second part, so part number two uh, of the series um, Slavic Fallacy, so fallacies about uh, Slavic people. In this uh, part I'm going to talk about Proto-Indo-European language and uh, how uh, I mean, I'm going to talk about the fallacy uh, in this theory uh, concerning the Slavic languages and their uh, place in uh, the whole theory of Proto-Indo-European. So basically, um, I'm going to talk about this new theory, uh, which is not sort of so new because it uh, it has been ten years that this uh, theory, this um, thesis was presented. Um, this uh, thesis um, says that, uh, in fact, uh, Proto-Indo-European is synonymous with Proto-Slavic, all right? So, Slavic languages are the core of all uh, Proto-Indo-European languages, okay? Uh, Indo-European languages. I'm going to present it in a moment. Why I'm, uh, am I talking about this today? Uh, because you know, in uh, uh, in the inter on the internet, um, in YouTube, you can find mainly um, stuff like this. Uh, this is the old tree, um, language tree, uh, Proto-Indo-European. Uh, you can find something like this as well, where uh, where Slavic languages are, both of Slavic are here. They are just a little branch, um, and uh, you can find something like this, and you can find something like this in Polish. And even Polish people, they do not really present our old story, old uh, history of uh, Slavic languages, uh, because it's still um, it's still a very uh, taboo uh, topic, and uh, I don't want it to be a taboo anymore. I think that uh, it has to be said what has to be said, the truth, all right? Um, and I'm going to present it in a moment to you. All right. In 1786, Sir William Jones expressed his view that Sanskrit is of more perfect structure than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, yet bearing to both of them a strong affinity, as if sprung from some common source. The same origin uh, have also the Gothic and the Celtic, though blended with a very different idiom and also Old Persian might be added to the same family. This was one of the cornerstones of modern linguistics. Additional publications by Friedrich von Schlegel in 1808, Franz Bopp in 1816 and Jacob Grimm in 1819 led to the foundations of comparative linguistics. Due to exclusive use of Sanskrit, Persian, Greek, Latin and Germanic, the name Indo-Germanic was coined. Observe that Slavic was not included. The Canton Satem division of Indo-European languages was finalized by contributions of several authors in 1890. Now, here is an overview of the origins, development and differentiation of Indo-Europeans uh, by Sir Jan Daczek and Anton Pertich. Their thinking is as follows. Number one, German attempt in the 19th century to marginalize the Slavic role in the Indo-Germanic languages was successful. This misinformation must be, must be rectified and the Slavic languages must be recognized as being key to the Indo-European phenomenon. The Slavic languages are not to be viewed as a peripheral branch of the Indo-European languages, but should be recognized as the trunk of the uh, language tree from which the other branches receive their substance and sustenance. Number two, Indo-German is a neologism which should be abandoned since Indo-Aryans branched from the Slavic mother tongue and Slavic mitochondrial and uh, Y chromosome genes some 9,000 years ago. Number two, Indo-Germanic is a neologism which should be abandoned since Indo-Aryans branched from the Slavic mother tongue and Slavic mitochondrial um, and Y chromosome 
genes some 9,000 years ago, and since Germanic languages branched from the Balto-Slavic source only perhaps 4,000 years ago, and subsequently incorporated Kelto, uh, Kelto-Baltic elements, it appears to point to a situation in which Germanic began to develop in the Saturn core, but moved away from the final Saturn innovations. It then moved into close contact with the uh, Western languages, Celtic and Italic, and borrowed much of its distinctive vocabulary from them. Number three, Slavic languages, as the organic trunk of the Indo-European language tree, give better terminology for the language branches. These branches would be Slav Indo-Iranic, Slav Armena Natolic, Slav Tokar Saitic, Slav Swe, Swe Vandal Gothic, Slav Celt Italic, and Slav Heli Lyric. Number four. Dictates of foreign elites, German, Hungarian, Italian, French, etc., etc., have been imposed upon speakers of several Slavic languages or dialects. However, standardized Slavic literary languages have also been forced upon the speakers of dialects. The ancient mosaic of the Slavic substratum throughout Europe was best preserved in those areas where national states failed to impose a standardized language dictated from capital cities. Regional Slavic dialects survive best in Slovenia and Slovenian-speaking regions of Italy, Croatia, Austria and Hungary. Remarkably, Slavic elements persisted with great frequency in Old English over a thousand years ago, for example in the Lord's Prayer, Father Ure. Old English used the Slavic word for bread, chlaf, as in chleb, chleb, chlib, chlib, and others. Um, number six. We can lump certain language branches into super branches, like Iranian languages can be lumped with languages uh, of India into Indo-Iranic, and Celtic and Italic languages can form a super branch Celt Italic, but ultimately all the branches and super branches issue from the Slavic trunk. The Slavic languages did not grow out of an Indo Germanic trunk. Okay, should I repeat? The Slavic language did not grow for out of an Indo Germanic trunk. Number seven. Proto-Slavic is in fact synonymous with, uh, synonymous with Proto-Indo-European and ought to be replaced in all literature. Number eight, Slavic languages, because they were the substratum in Europe, continue to be more mutually uh, intelligible than do the more recent Germanic, Romance, Celtic and other languages on the continent. Number nine, Veneti or Northern Italy, Veneti of Northern Italy and Venti, Veneti and other Slavic people of Western and Central Europe and uh, especially uh, along the Amber Trail who share similar spelling for the prototype Slavs and prototype Indo-Europeans. From here uh, they had spread to Vladivostok, to the east, and Greenland and North America to the west and India to the southeast. The Slavic people did not move westward from the Pripyat Pri river merely 1500 years ago, but were autochthonic population of Europe since the Stone Age. I talked about this in the fallacy uh, about Slavs uh, number one. Okay, film number one. If there were any Slavic migration of any significance, they would be in modern times towards Vladivostok. The Slavic toponymy observed in many parts of Europe could be inherited from prehistoric Venetic Slav populations or their predecessors. All right, that's it. Basically, um, it's not only them. Okay, we've got here Mr. Jan Dacek and Perdich. 
they are Slavs, Slavic people, all right? But there are other people and um, there are other names, all right? Uh, the Business Insider, for example, published the results of uh, other people like Russell Gray, Quentin Atkinson. Um, they were using mathematics to change the model of languages, all right? Um, uh, okay, so we've got Gray and Atkinson, but before uh, there were also Schmidt, Lehmann, Renfrew. And also they were talking that Slavic languages are the center, the core of all Indo-European uh, Indo languages. Uh, and before them there were Swadesh and Manchak, other researchers, and uh, it was verified in 2013 by Garrett and Chang. Uh, and it was commented by Mr. Hegarty and Renfro. So there were many people who really talked about this. Uh, so just change your mind because the Indo-European tree is not like you thought it was. All right, it's different. So basically, uh, the core of the Indo-European tree, language tree, uh, are Slavic languages. Okay, Balto-Slavic. So uh, just look at the pictures, look at the links, and change your mind. Thank you. Uh, subscribe, please, and like it, and take care, Joanna.